Thank you all for joining us today and being here with us for this very important topic. Uh, welcome to the University of Phoenix Educational Equity Webinar Series. This webinar series was created with the hope to foster a learning environment where we can explore paths to empower individual action toward greater unity and impact change. As a higher education institute with more than 56% underrepresented students employed across different industries, it's our hope to facilitate thought-provoking conversations to prepare and encourage the practice of inclusive leadership in a culturally complex society. And as you'll see here, we have the University of Phoenix's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we plan to demonstrate that commitment to you today. Move to the next slide. So next month, we invite you to join us for our next webinar, where we'll be talking about how our intentions sometimes don't make the impact that we had hoped. So more to come on that, and please join us for that. Before we get into our conversation today and more details, we do want to do a little housekeeping. So first, let's set the stage for today's session. Listed here are guidelines we believe are essential to fostering respectful conversations. We value your participation in potentially uncomfortable discussions as this reinforces our willingness to learn and grow. We encourage you to share your experiences and perspective in the chat box. Please be respectful and considerate of all human beings represented in this session. We also ask all participants to contribute to an atmosphere of mutual respect and sensitivity. We are connected because we are human. In addition, we highly encourage you to connect with one another, share your LinkedIn profile, and helpful resources related to today's topic. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The questions will be reviewed and answered throughout the session. Lastly, a recording of the session will be sent to you via email. We can move to the next slide, please. So before we get started, we want to honor and raise awareness of important equity, diversity, and inclusion dates and milestones. In the interest of inclusivity, we want to ensure that we're doing our best to recognize all such dates. We acknowledge that there might be some that we may, not, may have missed and invite you to share those in the chat if there's an observance aligned within the month of October that we've not listed here. Please include details along with the link or resource, or resource where we can learn more about its significance. So today we are extremely excited as today's webinar will have a special focus in alignment with October being National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Our topic for today is going to be there is no justice without disability. We're looking forward to a very engaging conversation. So to share more about University of Phoenix's commitment to disability services and accessibility, I'd like to introduce our colleague, Robert Becker, who oversees the Office of Accessibility Services. Rob? Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's topic about no justice with, um, without disability. Why is this important to the University of Phoenix and in higher education? It's about disability being included and reducing gatekeeping. And you may ask why I paused and didn't say some specific examples of how or where it needs to be included. It's because we need a creative lens to see how our own systems inherit ableism and gatekeeping. Example, how we notice disability is often artificially narrowed. Are you the wheelchair image or are you the YouTube closed captioned user? You probably would not introduce yourself in that way. However, there is an expectation that you fit into a narrow category in order to ask for an accommodation or accessibility or inclusion? I'm going to answer and say no. When we help individuals with disabilities, we need to remember that each individual does not need to fit into one of those narrow symbols. This lets us open, be open about gatekeeping and the breadth of disability awareness. For context, University of Phoenix can almost immediately help students who need assistance or accommodations in a current course. That is, with one phone call, we can set up accommodations. We ask staff and faculty to refer students to accessibility and disability services when a disability is disclosed. And this can be in the classroom or talking with an advisor, and we contact every student. For accessibility, our curriculum process requires, for example, that videos are captioned, that course content is available in text and works with keyboard, mouse, and is mobile friendly, and we follow the web content accessibility guidelines for more specific 
um, accessibility requirements. In higher education, if a student needs an accommodation, the process is that a disability service office needs to make a decision about how to reduce limitations and increase access. Let's do less ableism and let's get gatekeeping. And now I'll turn it back over to Tandra to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Rob. So amazing. So let's jump right into today's webinar. So today we are fortunate to have Rebecca Coakley with us. I'm gonna have Rebecca share more about what she does and who she is, but I do want to make sure that I make this very personal and say we're very excited to have her here today. Um, I heard her on a podcast that a colleague shared, then I began to follow her work um, and I'm just very excited. You are in for a treat in the way that she speaks about ableism and oppression and ties together that oppression, ableism, inequality, racism, this is gonna be an awesome chat. So just a quick introduction um, about Rebecca. She is the first US Disability Rights Program Officer for the Ford Foundation, co-founder and director of the Dis Disability Justice Initiative at the Center for American Progress, and she served in the Obama administration in similar roles as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca now. Rebecca. Thank you so much, Tondra. It's wonderful to be here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Coakley. Um, we can go to the first slide. Cool. Um, I uh, am here in New Jersey, which is unceded uh, Lenape territory. And my pronouns are she, hers. Um, it's spirit day. So right before this call, I threw on purple um, to represent the allyship that I feel very strongly committed to, actually co-accomplished ship, I would say that I feel very strongly committed to, uh, to my LGBTQIA allies. Um, I am a red-haired little person. Um, I have red hair about to my, it's a little shorter than it is in that photo there. Um, I got it cut about a week and a half ago and it's still in that awkward growing out phase. Um, I uh, have achondroplasia, which is the most common form of dwarfism. People often think that that's my, what they would say is my most disabling condition. Um, but in reality, that would be my migraines. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm a three-time presidential appointee. I had a pleasure of working for President Obama from lights on, or actually a little bit before lights on, uh, from the campaign days um, until the end of the administration, serving in a multitude of roles. Um, I was really involved in the 2020 election uh, and was instrumental in helping secure 13 different presidential candidate's commitment to issuing a disability policy plan, which has never happened before. Um, unlike 80% of people with disabilities that grow up in households with nobody like them, I'm the opposite. I'm part of the 20%. Both my parents had achondroplasia as well, um, and two of my three kids do. I am an AFOL, which is something I'm very proud of. I am an adult fan of Lego. Uh, we are currently staying in a corporate apartment, but once we move into our house, uh, part of the reason we have to move into a house is because my husband's a musician and has too many guitars, and I am an AFOL, and I have way too many Lego sets. Um, a huge diehard fan of the Liverpool Reds um, and, a, and a proud mom of three. Um, I'm way behind working on my first book, so it's more sort of an aspirational thing than a real thing, but it'll be out there someday. And I am so happy to be here with all of you today. Uh, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Oh yes, Martin, there are, is really such a thing as too many Legos. When you have to have a storage unit for your Legos, you have too many Legos. Um, so I really wanna talk to you all about why disability is such a powerful concept. To me, it is one of the most important definitions that we have in any statute. And I use the definition from the Americans with Disabilities Act that says it is any mental or physical impairment that impacts your activities of daily living, a history or a record of such an impairment. So it really does vary person to person. I was in a conversation with a colleague of mine who's an activist in Black Lives Matter spaces who had um, pre-COVID uh, decided to demonstrate her co accompliceship and came over to a disability rights rally that we were having on the Hill in DC. And she was sitting there with me, we were sitting on the steps um, outside the Capitol and she looked around and was quite literally surrounded by wheelchairs, walkers, scooters, crutches, all kinds of different types of mobility devices. And she said to me, you know, I don't talk about it often, but I have depression. 
And she said, and it really puts it in perspective when I'm in a place like this, that this is so much more significant to what, than to what I deal with. And I paused for a moment and I said, okay, friend, um, I wanna challenge you on that a little bit because it's really easy to, to create what we call a, a hierarchy of disability and to rank those with apparent disabilities as, as living a life with a more significant disability than those with mental health, learning disabilities or neurodiversities or chronic health conditions. And I said to her, does it, does it impact what you eat? And she paused and she said, you know, I've been noshing off the same two pound bag of gummy bears for the last week. I was like, all right, does it impact what you wear? And so let's, let's take this back. This is pre COVID times. And she said, this is the first day I've actually gotten out of my soft pants in about a month. And I was like, all right, does it impact how you engage with your loved ones? And she pulled out her phone and she showed me about a dozen missed calls from, from somebody that I assumed was her mom. And I was like, why are you ignoring your mom? And she said, well, my therapist retired and I need to find a new one. And my mom's worried about me. So I'm blowing her off. And then one of the guys that walked by behind us on using a walker was like, girl, you got problems that you need to figure out. <laughs> and it was really funny because I said to her, I said, well, for you and the work that you do, engaging with your loved ones, getting dressed in the morning, what you eat, those are all activities of daily living. When our elders wrote the ADA, they were really deliberate in not wanting it to be a specific checklist because they knew that the minute that you put a checklist down, there would always be people left behind. And so the importance of the definition is that it's broad enough to include everything that could be considered a mental or physical impairment that impacts someone's activities of daily living. And they vary for people. I have friends with dwarfism. For them, their dwarfism is a really significant impairment in their life. It impacts their, it could impact their mental health. For some types of dwarfism do coexist with learning disabilities. And so it impacts how they learn. Um, for me, my migraines will keep me in bed for a multitude of days, but you can't see that just by looking at me. Unless you know someone who has migraines because there are really interesting ways that we hold our face when we're migraining that I didn't realize till I started noticing it in myself and then noticing it in other people. So when we talk about disability, we're talking about 61 million people prior to COVID. We know that as a result of the coronavirus, we're talking about at least 10 million newly disabled people in the US alone. We're one in four people. So I also wanna take a moment and welcome all the people with disabilities that have joined us on this webinar and give a special solidarity shout out to the people on the webinar who are not in a position where they can safely self-identify as people with disabilities for whatever reason that may be. I see you and I hold space for you in this moment. Disability is also represented in one third of households. So if it's not your house, it's somebody either to the left, the right, or across the street from you. It is a broad enough organization or is a broad enough group that includes all the groups that we've talked about, people with physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, chronic health conditions. We also get both Britney Spears and Paris Hilton which is pretty exciting. If you would have told me that as a late stage Gen Xer a few years ago, I don't know I would have been as excited as I am now, but now we're very proud to claim both of them. Um, kids that uh, kids in Flint, Michigan, who are now 2,800 and some odd days from having clean drinking water and have acquired learning disabilities. People who have acquired disabilities as a result of environmental racism are included as people with disabilities. Uh, people experiencing postpartum depression count as people with disabilities. As I said, chronic illnesses and mental health conditions. If you are a woman and you have been told that there is some condition that you have and you have gone to a multitude of doctors, doctor after doctor has told you that it's all made up, that it's all in your head, chances are you are part of the disability community and you just haven't found the right chronic health uh, professional yet. Sending solidarity to all of you. For years, I was told that my migraines were um, functions of stress, functions of any other things, but were in fact not disabilities when they are. The last piece that's really important to note is the definition of disability specifically includes people who have experienced substance misuse and are in recovery. They count as people with disabilities and have civil rights protections under the law. 
So let's go to talking about from reality to justice. This is one of my favorite slides ever, and I've seen a whole bunch of different versions of this. And so this is the picture of the three folks standing at the fence line. Um, and it starts with reality. And so you have a guy in yellow pants, you can't even see his pants or his, you know, him in this first picture. It's mostly him about knees down. He's standing on about seven boxes in front of a fence next to him. And so he's way over the fence line. Next to him is somebody in very clearly 1970s short shorts. Look at how short those are. Nobody wears anything like that now, um, or nobody should wear anything like that now. And he is on one box. He's sort of, I guess I would say medium height, or he's an average as we call them in the little people community. Um, and he is staring right over the fence on standing on one box. The, the third individual um, is standing in a hole. He's not even on the on level ground or the box. He's already at a significant disadvantage. What it says is one gets more than is needed while the others get less than is needed. Thus a significant disparity is created. The next box is equality. And it's the notion that if everybody stands on one box, they are in effect all achieving equality. Everyone benefits from the exact same level of supports. And we know that even with that, as you see in the picture, you still have the person in the yellow pants being able to see everything perfectly. Um, you have the person in the two short shorts just having his fence, his head above the fence line so he can still watch the game. And the person that frankly reminds me a lot of me because I've been in these situations, particularly at clubs or bars, is stuck still staring at the fence because he's only on one box and there's still at least probably about a foot and a half of fence above his head. The third box says equity and it's that everyone getting the supports that they needed. And it's the tall dude standing and looking over the fence fine with an unobstructed view without any box. The, the medium or average guy in the short shorts uh, standing on one box and then the really short person standing on two boxes and everyone is able to see equally over the fence line without it with an unobstructed view. And the last box is justice. And I love justice because they just said, you know what, why do we even have this fence? Let's get rid of it. All three people can see the game without supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was, was addressed or eliminated. The barrier has been removed. I think that's really important. Often we use the words equality, equity, justice really interchangeably. And it really is important to have a sense of where they differ and why it matters. So I wanna talk a little bit about what ableism is on the next slide. And so ableism is a new term for a lot of people. Um, I also wanna be really deliberate in sharing that a majority of the images that we included in this uh, slide deck are from a group, this group right here called Disabled in Here, who created these images because they were tired of all of the available photo art of people with disabilities being grounded in medicalized ableism, largely being hospital centric, largely demonstrating people with disabilities as only being recipients of services. And they were frankly really like pale, male and stale. It was a lot of white dudes in wheelchairs, um, which isn't representative of what we actually know in terms of the diversity of the community. And so I, I like to give a particular shout out to my friends and colleagues from Disabled and Here for doing a lot of work to ensure that the imagery that we're able to use in demonstrating disability is a lot more diverse and a lot more representative. So when we talk about ableism, um, this definition comes from Talila T.L. Lewis, who runs an organization called HERD. And HERD works specifically on carceral reform for deaf and disabled people. Um, T.L. worked on this definition in conjunction with Dustin Gibson and some others back in 2020. And it defines ableism as a system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy intelligence, excellence, and productivity. These ideas, and this is really important, these ideas are deeply rooted in anti-Blackness, in eugenics, in colonialism, and capitalism. And we'll go into that a little bit later, but the, the roots of ableism and racism really do sprout from the same tree. This form of systemic oppression leads to people in society determining who is valuable and who is worthy based on a person's appearance and or their ability to satisfactorily produce or reproduce, excel and or behave. This is the important part too. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Someone can assume that you have a disability, whether or not you actually do. 
Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, you know, I see different framings around DEI. I see JEDIs now, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, I just still see DNI, diversity, and inclusion. And I think it's really important to acknowledge where inclusion comes from. Inclusion specifically comes out of the disability space. It was actually not used as a term of art anywhere until it was really first radically defined within the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act um, back in uh, an early re reauthorization of the law back in the 1980s. And it was fundamentally used to describe the placement of students with disabilities in a classroom setting alongside non-disabled peers. So the reality is if you're doing DEI work, JEDI work, DNI work, you cannot be doing inclusion if it's not explicit around disability. And it means understanding the relationship between the way that people function and how they participate in society and ensuring that everyone has the same opportunities to participate in every aspect of life to the best of their abilities and their desires. And I think that that is really important in every aspect of life. We were doing some work several years ago with colleges and universities. We were trying to get a sense of what colleges and universities are best for students with disabilities. And several of them told us about how accessible their classrooms were, how accessible their, um, their operations office or their administrative buildings were. And I remember asking how accessible their fraternities and sororities were and getting this really awkward look. And they were like, well, why would disabled people wanna join sororities and fraternities? And my response was, well, why wouldn't they? Isn't that part of, of why people would choose to, to belong on your campus? So I think it's really important that we think about it from a holistic standpoint and not from what, is, what are the bare bones that somebody needs to do to be able to access or include themselves in a space and think about that broadly around the culture of a, a workspace, a college, an organization, a social club, um, and really think about what is the access needs in order to get there. I see we have a question. Let's see what our question is. What are my thoughts on disability in? So um, disability in used to be called, it's funny because I always see that name and I have to remind myself what it is for a moment. Disability in was originally a project of the Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. And disability in is an organization that has a rating tool um, called the DEI, the Disability Equality Index. It's based off of HRC's index around LGBT inclusion that measures disability inclusion in organizations. I'm going to be totally honest in this space and find myself very conflicted. There are things that I think are really good about the ability to rate an organization's inclusion of people with disabilities. And I think you really can't evaluate obviously what you can't measure. My issue becomes when an organization gets a 100% score on the disability equality index from an employment side and then treats disabled people horribly as customers. And where I think about this the most and what keeps me up, one of the things that keeps me up at night, particularly enraged, um, is as it relates to the airline industry. Every year we see a multitude of airlines receive 100% on the DEI. Um, and honestly, I'm a bit of a troll sometimes on the internet. I may stay awake when the DEI score, um, when the equality index score comes out, just so I can see how many airlines get rated highly. Um, I have a bit of a snarky bone. I'm a Sagittarius that way. Um, and uh, watching the airlines continually get rated with 100% and then looking at the data from the Department of Transportation, which thankfully is now actually being evaluated and knowing that over 3,000 wheelchairs get damaged, lost, or broken a year. Now, I want you to think about what that means. It's not just a piece of equipment. And I think a lot of times for non-disabled people, they're like, oh, that sucks. It's like losing your luggage. It is not like losing your luggage. Losing your luggage might put a damper on your family vacation, but it doesn't mean you can't leave your hotel room. Um, the loss, damage, theft, or actually reassignment. I know somebody who had um, a custom wheelchair that cost upwards of $100,000 that they needed for their specific condition and the airlines gave it to somebody else. 
Um, they gave it to a senior citizen who had Alzheimer's, who drove it off, drove it away from the gate and smashed it into a wall. Um, and this person was flying into a town for a job interview and they lost the job. They didn't, weren't able to get the job um, because they couldn't start right away because they had to wait six to eight weeks for the airlines to approve a contractor to repair the wheelchair. Um, I know people who've lost custody of kids because of that issue. And it's, a, it's, it's unacceptable to me that the airline industry still doesn't take it seriously. And frankly, that disability organizations that are in a position to hold them accountable do not do so. As far as I'm concerned, and I'm a baseball fan, and I was all for Barry Bonds getting the red asterisk for cheating during the home run scandal. I think the airlines need to get a DEI score with a big old red asterisk on it. And that's where, that's where I'm at on it. Um, and my colleagues at Disability In are well aware of my opinion, um, but I will continue reminding them of that until they decide to actually do the right thing and, and bring justice to us on that conversation. So let's talk about access, what access is and not. Access is not, but we gave you a ramp. Um, the number of times that I personally have encountered this kind of moment, or I have seen friends encounter these situations, or colleagues encounter these situations, where we're treated as though we should be grateful that someone has decided to accommodate us. Um, disability access advances disability inclusion. You're right, also, Sean, uh, airlines do not think about sensory at all. They took forever to start actually doing right, and they still don't do right by many blind and deaf and other sensory disabled passengers. Um, so in a narrow sense, access are technical requirements that allow the participation of disabled people in the physical space, meaning ramps, doors, lighting, specifics in a meeting room, or also access to information, websites, video captioning, or other technological access. Accessibility is most powerful when it's tied to inclusive practices and policies that welcome and celebrate the participation of disabled people and not simply compliance with laws. I think about this all the time. Um, how many of you have ever been in a job where, uh, or have been in a situation where you get an email from HR or HR suddenly puts a, an appointment on your calendar? You could have done nothing wrong. You could have just started at the job. But merely seeing, you know, an HR appointment on your calendar, you're like, oh crap, what did I do? What's wrong? What's the problem? You know, that feeling is amplified when you're a person with a disability because frequently it has to do with your ability to access accommodations. And I often think, what would it look like, especially in this next phase of COVID, if the conversation around accommodations turned to one of success instead of one of compliance? What if your accommodations office, if it's on college or disability student services office, if it's in, an, you know, in a corporate office, if you have an ADA or 504 office, what if going back to work, let's say January of 2022, they put an email out to all staff and say, look, we know that this has been a really rough time. We know that many of you may have acquired health conditions, disabilities, chronic health illnesses, mental illnesses, um, that acquire accommodations. What would it mean uh, or what would it take for us to be able to make this workplace as accessible as possible for you? Are there things that you did over the last year and a half that helped and include some examples? Did you change up your lighting? Did you get a new chair? Did you switch around the hours that you work to hours that actually don't um, conflict with your medication side effects? Come share that with us and let's figure out what we can do. Let's be partners in this. And I think honestly, it's the most responsible thing that employers could be doing as we head back because the reality is we know that COVID shone a light on how many people with disabilities are in the workforce. How many people with disabilities had been asking for telework for decades and been told it was unreasonable. Um, but also there are so many more now and it would go so such a far distance and destigmatizing disability to actually make the conversation be one grounded in success versus legal compliance, even though the legal compliance piece is very important. Okay, we have a question. People with disabilities are the largest segment of the population, but when it comes to digital accessibility, the space is unregulated and a feeding frenzy of vendors and personal injury attorneys. 
trying to help people, uh, trying to help fully fund and partially funded government agencies navigate the space. Um, any advice to get the message more top of mind before the demand letters or 508 mandates? This is actually great. I was thinking about 508, which is the federal regulation around accessibility, but specifically internet accessibility. It's important to remember that the ADA was written at the very early days of the internet. The internet was not what it all what it is today by any means. When the ADA was first written, when the ADA started being drafted, actually, um, the week of the Challenger explosion was the the first time that the the legislation had been drafted. And so the internet was largely a twinkle in Al Gore's eye, I guess, as it were, at that point in time. I'm thinking about the fact that even today, there is such a lack of accessibility. Um, when I worked in the White House, I got a text message from a senior official who had forwarded me a text message um, from a very famous blind African-American musician who was touring at the time on I think it was the 20th anniversary of an album perhaps called Songs in the Key of Life. And he emailed a White House official from Los Angeles and said, I'm here in LA, it's two in the morning. I wanna order Roscoe's chicken and waffles. And I can't because Grubhub's not accessible. And the White House official supported me the email and said this very well-known, very famous African-American blind entertainer wants to order fried chicken at three o'clock in the two o'clock in the morning in Los Angeles and can't what what can we do for him and why can't we do this and I said well you could pick up the phone and order it for him yourself because we haven't signed the 508 regulations um, which would actually require Grubhub and a multitude of other sites yes it is pizza the Pizza Hut case all over again um, we haven't you know required that websites fall into legal compliance um, because of at that point in time, and probably I would say it's still relevant today, like fear of costs from the business community. And so it really is beyond time. I mean, you think about people pay their bills online. You think about the number of things that you use your cell phone for, and that for a multitude of groups within the disability community, we don't have that luxury. We don't have that ability. And that's a real problem. So let's start delving into to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I love this slide too. This is one of my favorites. Um, and it says, diversity asks who's in the room. Equity responds, who's trying to get in the room but can't? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure? I have a colleague I think of a lot who was a senior official at the Social Security Administration who has cerebral palsy and uses uh, augmentative communication board to talk. Bob is easily the smartest person that I know or one of the smartest people that I know. And I have been in a multitude of rooms over the years where I watch people, including people with disabilities, talk over Bob because they don't like waiting for him to be able to respond to the question asked. And I think about how many times Bob's genius has been erased or um, talked over and it really is important to think about not just who can't physically get in the room, but whose comments are being erased, whose comments are being talked over. Inclusion asks, has everyone's ideas been heard? Is the information in a format that everyone can access? Justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority? Um, I often think about being at diversity or civil rights conferences, and I joke that it's always the disabled folks, the First Nations, Native American community, and the trans community that are like the three kids waiting to be, the three leftover kids waiting to be uh, picked in kickball. And we all sort of stand against the back wall, like giving each other the nod and being like, yeah, we're here. We're the only people from our community here. We're invited because we're CEOs of organizations and it would look bad if we're not here. But yet we still aren't at the table. Diversity asks, how many more of X do we have this year versus last? That one I think is important because it really is critical that um, you measure things. I, I'm excited to say that when I was in the, well, I'm sad to say that when I was in the Obama administration, we were not publicly releasing diversity data on disability. But I'm really happy because several of those colleagues that I worked with then are now part of the Biden presidential personnel office and are releasing disability data. Um, 
And actually watching those numbers double matters. You can't be what you can't see. And we also know that it doesn't count if you can't measure it. And so it really does matter that we're actually being able to ask that question, even though often diversity doesn't get us to where we really need to be to have those conversations around justice. Equity responds, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as a perpetual majority here? I was on a board once where they only selected EDs of other organizations to be on the board. And it was majority white, straight, able-bodied men. And because the field that the, the board focused on was also largely very much white, cis, able-bodied, straight men centered. Um, and they couldn't figure out why they couldn't diversify the board. And it was like, well, if you set your pool to be X, that's what you're going to get. Um, inclusion asked, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? And then justice challenges, whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining dehumanizing views? These questions are all really important. And I think as we assess what it is that we're thinking about when we're talking about creating a place where everyone can bring them their whole selves to the table, really pushes us to get beyond just the, the notion of DNI to really delve into what does equity mean? What does justice mean? And why are they critical to actually having that conversation and creating organizations, class settings, spaces that allow people to bring their whole selves to the table and thrive in doing so. Let's talk about ableism and racism a bit. So as I said, ableism and racism really are branches of the same tree. One of the earliest mental illnesses publicly discussed um, in American discourse was the notion of drapetomania. Um, our founding fathers and, and thinkers at the time actually developed a fake mental illness called drapetomania in order to diagnose it to runaway slaves as part of the justification for the formal militarization of slave catchers. Um, they said that they were crazy, that they were ill, and for the good of themselves and society, they had to be brought back to the plantation. And so they actually like made up a mental illness to, to, to justify the arming of, of slave catchers to go out and catch um, escaped former slaves. You know, the, the field of science called phrenology, which later plays heavily into eugenics, which has to do with measuring of body types and measuring of proportions on a, on a human body was actually used to justify slavery from its earliest days. And so there is this connection of the medicalized sense of a person and what they're capable of that we actually heard talked about when we were talking about ableism, the ability of one to produce, reproduce, to engage in the economy, et cetera, is never more clearly displayed than when you're looking at the conversation around the earliest days and pretty much the entire tenure of slavery. And even let's also be real, you can see this also show up today in how we hear sports commentators often talk about black and brown athletes. Um, and so it's important when you hear that, exactly, look at what's happening in the NFL and concussions. Look at the, look at the difference in the settlements that black athletes are getting versus white athletes and tell me that that's not the nexus of racism and ableism. So I'm going to challenge you all, if you're still watching football, I'm from, I, I lived in DC, I'm a former 49er fan, I stand with Kaepernick 100%, so I haven't watched football in a long time, but you cannot watch major league sports and specifically football without forcing yourself to examine ableism and racism. Um, let's go to intersections of racism and ableism next. And this is how it plays out in society. We know that at least 50% of people that are killed by cops are people of color with disabilities. We actually don't know the exact numbers because law enforcement and the Department of Justice don't allow the data um, to be cross-referenced to be able to get at both. The data that we do have currently, the best data that's available is from the Washington Post and it's purely what's pulled from media reports. We know that students of color with disabilities are more likely to be suspended or expelled. Specifically, Black girls with disabilities have the highest rates of suspension and expulsion in the country. Um, 
the attack on the public charge this last several years of the Trump administration, we saw a pushing of um, the public charge, which was something actually that the US had done away with for a long time that the Trump administration brought back that still exists in a lot of countries that says, if you wanna to immigrate to that country, they're going to evaluate your health and what public services you receive. And they will evaluate if you should ever need those public services, you'll be a tax on the society and they won't allow you to immigrate. Um, this issue was the first time that we had ever largely seen the disability rights and justice community engage in a fight on immigration policy. It was really exciting to see, it was important to see us show up in solidarity with our, our longstanding immigration activist allies. Um, and the, the reason for that was twofold. One, um, as you know, as bad as the last four years were, the number of times I watched able-bodied or non-disabled people on the internet say, well, if you don't like it here, you can leave. Disabled people can't leave. Over 80% of other countries in the world have a public charge that prevents us from leaving um, and being able to, to immigrate to another country because we would be seen as a tax on their system. Um, you know, and furthermore, there are a multitude of, of home health care aides, nurses, medical professions that actually come to the US and want to immigrate because they have a loved one with a disability and they know that they can receive a better quality of care here than they can in their home country. It's also important to note that climate change creates disabilities and exacerbates disabilities, specifically in communities of color. And the last piece I think is really interesting. Um, over 70% of people with disabilities in this country are unemployed, uh, resulting in increased rates for entrepreneurship among our community. However, the Small Business Administration does not include disability as a qualified category for minority owned small business loans. And they include women's, women, communities of color, and veterans, but not just your average run-of-the-mill disabled person. Let's uh, go to the next slide. The laborious expectation of education. Um, and as an, uh, Martin, I will talk to you about John Gruden later as a Niners fan. I automatically always have hate for Raider Nation, but that's just me. Um, the laborious expectation of education. So this is a koala. I share the koala because koalas are cute and cuddly. Um, and often as a person with a disability, that's how you're treated. Uh, this is also a reminder that often we expect people with disabilities to have to do the education for non-disabled people. Uh, and that's not a fair expectation of labor. We often have to operate off of a limited picture of what it means for ourselves and our condition. And what I like to call traumatic voyeurism. Um, as people with disabilities from the time that we're first diagnosed, we're often told that we should share the worst case scenario for our conditions. We should focus on the pain. We should focus on the oppression. We should focus on telling the worst story possible because the reality is that is the only way that we end up getting the services we need by painting the worst picture possible. We live in a system where we want to hear people's sob stories. And it really makes it hard to be successful, to be ambitious, when society continues to wanna to hear about your worst day ever. And it really need, means that we as educators, we in the field of education, in the field of employment, helping hire people, need to be more thoughtful and strategic with how we have these conversations with people and how we ask them to engage. Um, often we call this the self-narrating zoo exhibit because as a person with a disability, sometimes you feel like uh, you're your own David Attenborough um, relaying a planet Earth-esque Earth episode about your life and your experience. Uh, let's go to performatory allyship. So this is defined by Jamila Thomas and Brianna Ajamont. You'll notice that I cite all of the stuff where I have citations for other people, because I think that that's really important, especially as we talk about the erasure of credit in a lot of fields, especially that disabled people face, but I also wanna acknowledge it is disproportionately faced uh, by black women. So performatory allyship is when someone from that same non-marginalized group professes support and solidarity with a marginalized group in a way that either isn't helpful or actively harms the group. Performative allyship usually involves the ally receiving some kind of reward on social media. It's that virtual pat on the back for being such a good person or on the right side. I often think about this when you see people fundraise to get their dogs wheelchairs. Um, not that dogs don't need wheelchairs, but I think it's important to note 
that over one third of GoFundMes in this country are actually led by human beings that are attempting to get uh, a medical cost reimbursed that um, is not covered by health insurance. And yet you sit, if you go on GoFundMe and you watch how long it takes to get a dog, a $50,000 wheelchair compared to a person, a $50,000 wheelchair. And the dog will inevitably get the wheelchair within a number of days. And the people that fundraise for the dog are very excited. Look, I put money in to get Fido a wheelchair. That's so important. And I'm a dog owner, I love dogs. But the fact that people with disabilities are out there struggling to be able to get to work, to be able to live their life. And society does not build structures that enable them to do that. And then society turns around and pats on the back non-disabled people for buying a dog a wheelchair or you know, does a special news story. Uh, yes, I was exactly about to say that, Christina. I'm so happy you said that. Prom king shares crown with a person with an intellectual disability. Wow, that prom king is the best. I was gonna say like uh, prom, um, someone called it, what did they call it last year? Inspiration prom or something like that. Every time they see, whether it be the, the high school quarterback takes the poor lowly girl with autism to the prom, things like that. It's so obnoxious. We don't appreciate you for that. We actually talk crap about you as non-disabled people behind your backs when you do that sort of thing. We're like, oh, look, the Ables have discovered prom again. Yay, Ables. You can be so much better than that and actually thinking about how to move forward in actual co-conspiratorship. Let's go to the next slide. So moving beyond performatory allyship. Um, I have a couple of quotes here from people I love, um, one of which is my CEO, Darren Walker. Um, Darren talks a lot about embracing risk and reflecting honesty. When Darren came to the Ford Foundation in 2016, he committed Ford's dollars to going directly to uh, social justice. And he talked about racial justice, gender justice, LGBT justice, immigrant justice. You know, who he didn't leave in the mix? The disability community. Um, and as I said, as a Sagittarius, I'm a bit of a troll streak. And so the disability community trolled him really hard on the internet. And one of the things that I credit him with, um, and, and I lift him up and why he is my, my friend, my boss, and every now and then a bit of a hero, um, is he took it really seriously. And he took about a year and a half and spent a lot of time talking to disabled people in his life and that he had encountered through philanthropy and through his other um, community service work. He started examining his bias. He started examining corporations bias and he started really examining philanthropy's bias. And the notion that in all of the time that the Ford Foundation had existed, it had only ever given away one grant to a disability justice or disability rights organization. Um, and it was to a, a legal defense fund in the Bay Area. And it was a $10,000 check in the 1970s and with it went a note saying, go, at, go beg the federal government for money. This is the one and only check you're getting from us. And then the reality is that is how philanthropy has treated disability for decades, if not centuries, that we are the responsibility of government to take care of and of charity, and that we shouldn't expect other organizations whose job is funding social justice movements to include us at their table. And I really want to credit Darren because he's actually done a phenomenal bit to turn around philanthropy. But part of it really did involve him having to unpack bias. This work doesn't just happen. You actually have to do the tangible work of moving beyond the performatory stuff to actual co accompliship um, It's speaking out so others don't have to. It's, uh, I remember being in a room years ago and they were talking about coming out with a new blueprint for domestic, for a domestic economic agenda. And they were going to call it the hometown agenda. And I remember sitting in that room and watching all of my black and brown colleagues sort of like throw the eye at each other and give each other the nod. And the, the level of unease, I could feel it. As a little person, I tend to find that I am more sensitive to those sorts of things. Um, but the people facilitating just moved along and were acting like it was the greatest thing that we were gonna have a hoedown and you know, there would be like hay rides and whatever, I don't even know. And I remember pausing and, you know, having that moment where I sort of had, you know, the old school angel on one shoulder and devil on the other. And I was new at this job. I'd been in the job about two or three weeks. Um, and it was when I was in the nonprofit space. And I remember raising my hand and being like, hometown agenda. Doesn't that sound a bit 
pedantic. Doesn't that sound a bit like, I was like, hometown to me tells me that I can't get in the library because there are steps and not a ramp and there's no elevator. And that all the books are gonna be at least at the six foot level that I need. Hometown for me means I go with my dad to vote and I have to carry his ballot in because the only place to vote in the hometown is the church and 85% of churches in this country still don't comply with the ADA because they don't have to. And I was like, hometown also sounds a lot like sundown towns. Um, can we actually unpack that and get to a better place and, and come up with a terminology that's more inclusive of everyone? Um, and I remember like shaking as I was saying, because I was new. I was also the only disabled, only visibly disabled person in the room as I often am. And sometimes you have to put yourself out there because it's the right thing to do. The last thing is, uh, I'm gonna quote my colleague, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, um, who says budgets are moral documents. Spending money on accommodations and access needs makes you a better employer. It's also, it is also the law. It is also the right thing to do. And it does make people with disabilities want to work at your organization. Does it make us want to stay there forever, even if there's bad pay and bad management? No. But it opens the door for opportunities, and it's important not to forget that. Um, next is a slide from, uh, we have, actually, we have a question. Lori, did you want to take a moment and ask your question? Participants aren't able to unmute Rebecca, so she'll okay. have to either type it or... Okay, Laura, if you want to type it in the chat or put it in the Q&A, that's great. Tabitha brought up a really important too, saying disabled, chronically ill people may rely on online organizing and activism when unable to occupy other spaces, especially physically. This gets incorrectly rolled into performative acts. That is so true. I hate the term selectivism because what it tells me is that non-disabled people still haven't figured out how to keep up with us on the internet. We are the most organized group online. We know how to build things up. We know how to tear things down. And often that will get maligned and that will be told, well, the disabled people didn't show up to the rally. No, we didn't show up to your rally because it was hot as heck. We're in a pandemic. It was inaccessible. There were not interpreters, whatever the reason is. But we still can out organize you in five minutes compared to what non-disabled people can do in hours. Because we have to, because we live in a world that you have built to be fundamentally inaccessible. And I think it's really important to note um, that this does raise discomfort and that, you know, thinking, having conversations around access and inclusion do make people uncomfortable. And this slide is, is a quote from my friend, Maurice Mitchell, um, who says, your individual anxiety about possibly getting things wrong has nothing to do with my liberation. And I remember having a conversation with some non-disabled colleagues and saying, hey, have we thought about access needs for X event? And the response was, well, it's really awkward to have that conversation with so-and-so. Or, oh, we forgot to hire interpreters, but we're not going to say anything until the event. And we're just going to hope that like Bob and Molly don't show up. That is the worst thing that you can do. I don't really care that these conversations might be awkward for you. We have to have these conversations all the time. We have to put our entire medical record out there sometimes in order to get a step stool on a job. The fact that somebody might be made uncomfortable by us talking about access, by having to wait for Bob's words to come out of his AAC device, by having to wait for our, our, our autistic colleagues to have a break because we've been on Zoom for four hours in a day and it's overstimulating, that's the reality. Your anxiety has nothing to do with my, my liberation. Let's go to the next slide. So how can we do the learning? Google and internet research is really important. Um, as I said, you don't wanna be self-narrating zoo exhibits. So at least start doing the research on your own. Learning cohorts. At the Ford Foundation, we have a disability learning group, which includes program officers and other staff who wanna get better about disability grant making, but also wanna learn more about the community. It's different than our employee resource group because it's beyond just disabled folks. Um, but it allows for us to bring in different speakers um, with different types of backgrounds and learn more. Teaming up for various months of commemoration. I was really excited to see that list that you all had. And like I said, I'm wearing purple for Spirit Day because it matters to me to be an ally specifically to my black and brown LGBT loved ones and colleagues. Um, but it's also important to think through each of those days for Hispanic Heritage Month. Are you lifting up Dr. Javier Robles, who's a quadriplegic doctor at Rutgers who's doing amazing work on COVID? You know, when you're talking about Harriet Tubman, 
for Black History Month. Are you talking about the fact that she had epilepsy that was acquired as a result of being hit on the head by a shovel, but that she used her seizures as part of the lore around her. She actually created hype around it and would tell people that when she would have a spell, when she was on a, journey, a liberatory journey, that it was actually how she got the vision of where they needed to go. It actually gave people faith in her as a leader, which I think is so profoundly powerful and is so important because so rarely do we actually see people frame a disability from a position of, of strength and from assets. Um, honestly, the best organized disability group I know of right now is the Asian American Disability Initiative, which is a bunch of college students at Princeton um, that have all self-identified as students with disabilities, largely with chronic health conditions. And they are so organized, they are going to take on the world. Um, and I'm just hoping that they decide to actually like do the college thing at this time. But it's really important to note that as we're talking about disability, actually creating a learning does not mean segregating it in National Disability Employment Awareness Month, but thinking about how can you bring like your disability ERG together with your African-American ERG? How are you bringing the LGBT community in the mix around, around what pride looks like in these different months? around what it means, you know, my friend David Johns, who runs the Black Justice Coalition, talks about, has, has moved past the language of coming out and instead says, what does it mean to invite people into your truth? Yes, the movie Harriet did a really great job. And actually I will give additional credit to Misha Green's show, um, Underground, which if you have not seen it, is the best two seasons of television that you likely never saw. And actually the first time that we ever saw Harriet Tubman portrayed on screen, as having a disability. And I strongly recommend that you will work, you will hate yourself for not having watched it when it was on. Um, it was probably one of the few shows I saw that I've actually done a really good job demonstrating intersecting oppressions on television in a way that I haven't seen it before. And I believe that that's it. Um, yes. Oh my God, Tondra, I knew we were meant to be friends. Like Underground is, is my show. I, I love it so much. Um, such a fangirl. So here's how to find me. Um, my email address, r.coakley at boardfoundation.org. But honestly, the easiest way to track me down, I'm not going to lie, is Twitter. My, my mailbox is a dumpster fire. Um, I wanted to open it up one last time. I think we do have a couple of other questions in the chat. Struggling on where to start with an ERG and what to focus on since it covers so many things. Any suggestions? The coronavirus gives us a unique opportunity to really think about disability. Um, organizations are all having conversations about what does it mean to return to work? I think it's a huge opportunity for disability ERGs to flex their muscle and their expertise. We're used to being flexible. We're used to being thoughtful. Um, being able to have conversations about what should return to work look like? What does responsible return to work look like? Um, is there the opportunity for folks that are currently in the disability ERG to mentor any returning staff who now have long haul COVID and are now trying to figure out how to navigate the world with a new disability. That's really important. Um, you know, but I think that there's a multitude of things that you can work on and Laura, I'm happy to have conversations with you about this offline. Um, in a leadership development cohort, let's see, group project in its infancy that relates to DEI and creating a business mentorship program to help facilitate the next crop of diverse business people. Any tips? Um, you know, I think it's important that, you know, a lot of people can't be what you can't see, but so many senior leaders, I mean, I do firmly believe that there are way more senior business leaders with disabilities than are safe being out. Um, and so I think there is a really important role for allies and finding folks who are, um, who celebrate the diversity of other folks. And so thinking about um, where you get your mentors from, also thinking that if you're centering people with disabilities, that they may also be people of color, they may also be LGBT. And so tapping those networks as well. And really thinking about how do you create a safe space where anybody can bring the whole of their identities to the table for that conversation. Um, do I have any recommendations for a high school counselor working with students with disabilities? Oh, I have so many. Um, the first I would say is I would strongly encourage you 
to work with families to have their student with a disability in their 504 or their IEP meetings starting freshman year. Waiting until someone is 16 to involve them in transition planning is an abomination and has set young people with disabilities up for failure for decades. The fact that we don't transition plan until high school is horrible. One of the things I loved about working with Julian Castro was he actually wanted to move transition planning for young people with disabilities to the transition from elementary school to middle school and start requiring the presence of students with disabilities in their 504 plans and IEPs starting, in, or starting in, in fifth grade because students need to understand how to advocate for themselves. They need to understand their parents aren't always going to be there for them to do it. Um, and there is such an opportunity to think about like what that looks like, but you can't do it if you're not at the table. And so actually teaching young people with disabilities to expect to be at the table and that they have a right to be at the table as early on is critically important. Um, and one last question, how can we partner with career management and do a better job of transitioning disabled students to meaningful career paths? Um, that's a much longer question. I would love to have a conversation on that. Sherry, hit me up on either email or Twitter and we can have that conversation. But that's a really important piece. Transition from school to work is huge. Um, and it means moving beyond the eight Fs of disability employment, which Chandra, maybe we talk about that next year, which is food, fill, fetching, folding, filing, flowers, festive, and friendly. Those are the eight areas of jobs that often young people with disabilities get tracked into. Um, instead of the top grossing, top moving jobs in the, in the economy. And so happy to have that conversation with you, Sherry. And thank you so much for all of you for joining me today. Y'all stuck with this. I'm a few minutes over um, and I'm happy to be a resource going further. And thank you so much, Tondra. You're the best. Thank you, Rebecca. You are the best. And what a way to end with the promise that we can bring her back. Yay, silent clap. I'm so excited about that. This was awesome. As you all can see, there was so much to learn here. Um, Rebecca packed it all into an hour. Maybe she can host a separate session on how to run a PowerPoint and also manage the chat and effectively do it without missing a beat. That was just absolutely amazing. Um, so we thank you all for joining us and for everything that uh, you learned today. We ask for you to come back next month for our webinar on November 19th. The QR code is here. We have shared a link in the chat. In addition, please, please uh, check your emails. We will be releasing the recording of this session and all prior sessions um, via our YouTube channel. The link to that is in the chat as well. We thank you all for joining us today and we wish you a well week. Thank you. Bye-bye.